members, thank you. All the faculty members, my colleagues watching, most of all my fellow students. Yes, I said fellow students. You are much younger than I am, and perhaps I'm uh, probably even older than your respected professors. But I think all of us are students. We keep learning as we go through life, and in a world where your compare rightly said the change is only really constant. The day you stop learning is the day you effectively die. So for us, learning keeps going all the way. It's a pleasure. I think I'm a lot shorter than you guys are. In, in a world where change is there, it needs that we are constantly looking at what we need to be doing in this context. So I am genuinely pleased to be here to speak to fellow students on this occasion and let me begin by congratulating you on the work that you have done in organizing this event. The program schedule which you have drawn up, the people whom I have heard listed as speakers in the day going forward, the coverage of the events, it does a lot of credit to the planning work which you students have done and I am sure under the guidance of your professors. So it's a privilege for me to be here with you today and to talk to you on this particular keynote subject. Today what's happening in the world around us is change. There is often a debate whether change is evolutionary or revolutionary. Leaving that aside, what you're seeing today is change where not just one factor is changing or one variable is changing but you are seeing multiple variables changing all at the same time. So whether it is evolution or revolution doesn't really matter. What really matters is the width and the size scope of the change which is happening and how do we deal with it. What do I mean by this? Let me go through by these factors of change one by one. Firstly, the growth of grade is now much slower. And this is something of importance to IIT, to Exim Bank of India for that matter to all of India because trade is an increasing portion of importance for us. If you recall the early days of India, trade was barely 8 to 10 percent of our GDP. Today international trade is more than 50 percent of our GDP. So that gives you an idea of how important trade is for us as a country and how it matters to us if trade is impacted in any way because a significant part of our economy is trade dependent. Over the last few years, the global economic growth has slowed down. It used to be about 5 to 6 percent earlier. It was down to 3.2 in 2016. What's special about that? 3.2 percent global GDP growth is the slowest that the world has ever grown since the global economic crisis of 2009. I'm not going to go into the details of the crisis. You're all as familiar with it as I am. Now, according to the World Trade Organization, Global merchandise trade, leaving aside other trade, was as low as 1.3 percent growth in 2016. Now, 1.3 percent growth is practically a statistical anomaly. It means absolutely nothing. Why is merchandise trade growth so low? This is because of a slowdown primarily in the emerging economies. What else happened? That was one factor that trade itself has slowed down. Beyond that, 2016, last year also saw a lot of structural changes in the relationship between trade and economic output and this is perhaps more serious than the mere slowdown in trade. You could say that a slowdown in one year is a blip, a statistical anomaly which could be corrected. But if you look at the relationship here and there is a deeper sign of trouble lying ahead for us. According to the IMF, this about three-fourths of the slowdown in trade growth is because of the slowdown in economic growth. And this is where you had a slowdown particularly in investment growth in countries like the United States which had a growth in consumption but not in investment, in China which is rebalancing its economy away from investment. A lot of unproductive investment was engaged in earlier. It is now trying to reorient its economy towards consumption. Now to change an economy of the size of China at purchasing power parity terms the largest economy in the world effectively for all practical purposes it's a huge change which is happening and this is driving the change here. If you are moving away from investment to consumption, there is a downstream change again on demand and that is also slowing down trade. So two factors have already hit. The third factor is commodity prices. So this year, as you are as familiar with it as I am. 
you've seen a drop in oil prices and that is the headline price. But you've also seen a drop in metals, in oats, in natural commodities, in railroads. There's been a secular decline in the prices of commodities. So this is good and bad. It's very good for a country like India, in the short run definitely, because we are hugely dependent on imports of petroleum. So the benefit on our balance of trade has been tremendous. But look deeper into the numbers and you'll see trouble lying ahead. Where is our major project exports coming from? The Middle East market. Where are the major sources of our remittance income? The United States and the Middle East. If you are going to have a slowdown in oil prices in the Middle East, sooner or later that is going to feature through into a slowdown in remittances, into a slowdown in project exports. So it's not an unalloyed benefit which is happening to us. And the reduction in income of the, the commodity exporting countries has now hurt export demand as well. Fourth, and fourth is perhaps the most worrying of all in terms of numbers. Trade usually is a factor of growth as I said and there is a multiplier effect built into here. For the first time in decades, the ratio of growth in trade to growth in GDP dropped below 1.1%. 1 .1%. In 2016, it was 0 0.6 to 1. That is, for every one unit increase in global demand, global growth, trade grew by 0.6%. So trade is growing slower than the growth in global trade. Remember my first point, that global growth has slowed down. Now you have a situation where the rate of change of growth, trade growth to global growth is also slowing down. So you are getting hit with a double whack. What was the historical experience? Historically, merchandise trade used to grow at 1.5 times the growth of global GDP. So you are facing a situation now where you are at less than parity, you are growing slow and at a slow global rate. So you are getting hit from multiple sides over here. And this is a very serious development for all of us. Fifth is in a way is perhaps a not quantifiable way. Protectionism. That's one of the themes of your seminar as well. There is a growing sense around the world that since growth has slowed down, employment has slowed down, the typical scapegoat is free. Let's get more protectionists. Let's safeguard our domestic industries, let's keep barriers to overseas uh, imports and that will help protect jobs. No, it will not. The real reason for the loss in jobs is nothing to do with trade, it's automation. Automation of processes, automation of manufacturing, automation of services, all as that may sound, is what is leading to a decrease in employment. And that's something, my dear friends, we should worry all of you. Because you are now going to be entering the employment market and you will be facing a very different dynamic. So protectionism is not going to solve this problem, it's going to make it much worse. It was Paul Krugman, the, the, novel, the economic novel prize winner, who pointed out something. Modern trade is comprised primarily of intermediates. Trade in finished goods is one small part of the whole story. Trade in intermediates, the iPhones and iPads which we all use, the final commodity is not the real issue. It is the number of subcomponents of integrated circuits, the safeguard, the gorilla glass, the copper, the communication modems and others which go into it. If you are going to slap tariffs on trade, then what you are doing is hurting intermediates. Steel is a classic example here in India. Because the steel industry was suffering from overcapacity and dumping of steel from overseas, particularly from China, we interposed minimum import prices, we put safeguard tariffs. Now that's great news for the steel industry and I'm sure the steel companies were very happy about it. But what about the downstream industry? What about the automobile industry which uses cold rolled steel? What about the white goods industry for consumer durables? What about the number of industries that structural steel? Suddenly they see their costs going up. So there is no single magic bullet which can address one trade problem without impacting other trade problems at the same time. And this is a lesson we are all learning the hard way once again. Further, the other not quantifiable. You have uncertainties with the United Kingdom now, now deciding to withdraw from the European Union through the famous Brexit. A strange, peculiar, and if I were to be blunt, I would say a stupid decision, but a decision which has been made by a majority of people voting. So one has to respect that decision. Now, is this going to be a hard Brexit? Overnight, there's a night of light and if the UK leaves the, the European Union, that would be chaos all over. Or will it be a soft exit? Time is running out. We're already into August 2017. 
and March 2019 is the deadline for Brexit. I don't, you don't see anything happening on the ground over there. So what is going to happen to India's investment into UK? Remember, India is the largest foreign investor into the United Kingdom. What's going to happen to all the money we have invested there? Into the plants we have taken over? Into the financial investments that we've made? In? We don't know. The global anti-globalization sentiment in the United States. President Trump was elected on a somewhat chaotic platform of promises, most of which are contradictory, probably will never be implemented, but it has caused a great deal of uncertainty also in the minds of people as to what his trade policy is. In his very first month of the job, he exited from the Tega, from the Trans-Pacific Partnership. A bad decision, the rest of the world is now going to go ahead. He has exited from the Paris IPO call, he is threatening to renegotiate NAFTA. What is that going to do? It's not going to help the United States. It's not going to bring back jobs. It's going to put the whole world going backwards. So rising protectionism that we are seeing in this area is not a cure. It is in fact making the disease much worse than it otherwise would have been. Now what the WTO estimates is that trade can grow at the rate of 2.4% as compared to 1.3% this last year, provided the developed economies maintain their openness to trade, they maintain accommodative fiscal and monetary policies, and they allow trade to grow. Will this happen? I don't know. I don't think any of us knows the answer to that. The political rhetoric is very high, it's very loud. We don't know whether that rhetoric will translate to action on the ground or it will remain rhetoric. So this is a big worry for all of us. So where do we go from here? I don't want to be in a situation where I present you with a laundry list of problems and then tell you, well, let's go back home and cry. No. There are ways to get around it. One of the big ways we are all looking at is trade facilitation. If you recall, in the last couple of years, and you probably studied about it in some of your lectures, trade facilitation was a big issue at the WTO and India. We almost brought it to a halt because of other reasons related to agriculture. I am not going to get into the strategy. That was a strategy employed for good reason. It worked. But trade facilitation is now moving ahead strongly across the world. As of March 2017, 113 of the WTO members, which is almost 70%, have already ratified the trade facilitation agreement. And 93 countries have already given the WTO a schedule of dates on which they will comply with the various sub-parameters of trade facilitation. So that is a good sign because it means that countries are realizing that trade is important and they cannot stand in the way of trade. They need to build in the trade facilitation measures which will allow trade to grow. Another interesting trend which you can look at is the change in the import intensity. Now, first of all, let me put a KD over here, which might sound strange to me for you, coming from the Exxon Bank. We have a tendency in India to treat exports good, imports bad. Exports on precious foreign exchange. In inverted commas, imports use precious foreign exchange. This is ideology. This is the ideology of the 60s, the 70s, and the 80s, which we need to forget. There is nothing intrinsically good or bad about exports or imports. It's trade, it's business. In fact, if I were to be a little heretical, I would ask you, why do I need to export at all? Why should I export? I need to export because I have to pay for my imports. When I import, and I need to import petroleum, I need to import machinery, I need to import a whole lot of things. When I import, nobody is going to accept my home currency, the rupee, because it is not a convertible currency. It's convertible on, on uh, current account. It's not convertible on, uh, on capital account. And an overseas buyer or seller cannot hedge himself in his home currency against the Indian rupee because the currency is not convertible. So he cannot accept the Indian rupee as a trade currency. Therefore, if he wants to be paid in dollars, I have to have a source of dollars in which to pay him, which means exports. So as long as I can pay for my imports, I need to export. Beyond that, it's not a criminal uh, uh, to import, nor is it a particular virtue to export. It's a pure macro business. But when you look at import intensity, the picture changes. In India itself, one of our big exports is refined petroleum products. So where is this refined petroleum coming from? We don't produce that much of crude petroleum. What we're doing is we're importing crude petroleum, refining it in our very high world class refineries and exporting the refined petroleum. Now here there is value addition. 
there's a strong value addition from the crude petroleum to the refined petroleum products. Not so in the case of Jepson jewelry. We import gold, we import unpolished diamonds, we polish those diamonds, we make jewelry. But in jewelry, you'll all agree with me, the ladies more than the guys, we guys tend to be totally ignorant about jewelry. But you will find that the value of the gold, the intrinsic value of the gold and the precious stones is the major component of that piece of jewelry. The artistry which goes into creating that jewelry is much less. So what is the value addition that we are doing? Very less. Now look at the same trend across the world. Look at China. Look at Germany. In China, the import content of Chinese investment spending, investment spending, I'm not talking consumption, it was 30% in 2004. It dropped to 18% in 2014, almost by half. That's a major change, major change in structural trade. Germany went the exact opposite way. Germany was 24% import content in 1995. It went to 38% in 2014. So what you're seeing is a change in the entire pattern of trade between Asia on the one hand and Europe on the other hand. You might just see stronger trade in Europe and slower trade in Asia, which is counterintuitive to everything that we have studied and everything that we have learned in the recent past. So again, we have to adjust to a completely different paradigm of what the trading world is going to look like in the future. What about India? We've talked about manufacturing, but if you look at the structure of Indian GDP, what is the largest component of GDP? I'm sure you've studied it in your economics level. It's services. In the past, this was held against us. Services by economic theory are supposedly not credible for the major part and therefore cannot contribute so much to exports. Really, take a look at what India is doing. Remember, we consistently run a deficit on merchandise trade and we consistently run a surplus on services. We export more services than we import. In fact, for India, we are one of the few emerging market countries where the trade deficit is irrelevant. The headline trade deficit is a number. What matters most is the current account deficit. And the current account deficit is far smaller. Which brings me back to the earlier point. Why do I need exports to pay for imports? But my current account deficit is tiny. So that change in paradigm is something that we need to see. But it doesn't mean that we sit on our laurels. Our IT industry is already facing decades. Our IT industry got its birth in the 2000s with Y2K being a big challenge. But today the world is changing. Mere programming is no longer enough. Mere products are no longer enough. Where are the trends? It's in additive manufacturing, it's in artificial intelligence. I had a very intelligent young man who escorted me to the institute this morning and we engaged in a spirited debate along the way as to whether doctors are going to be superfluous someday. Because after all, what is diagnosis? Diagnosis is looking at a set of parameters, identifying where the result falls on that parameter within a given range and then deciding that this is disease A or disease B or disease C. Now once you have those parameters fed into a machine, the machine can probably make the decision. But the machine doesn't have the experience. Now if you talk to your professors here, or you talk to Subhashish or myself, and we tell you we've all studied. But what matters is that experience. We've seen a thousand companies, we've read a thousand balance sheets. We can look at a balance sheet today and without knowing what is wrong, tell you that there's a problem. We won't even know that because we have seen that many. That is what a doctor, uh, artificial intelligence cannot do. It can't do it today. What about tomorrow? Next week, next year, the next five years? Already artificial intelligence, when you go on Amazon, Amazon is already telling you what you want to buy. If you've been buying books on a particular subject earlier, the next time you log on to Amazon, you've got a list of those books. If you bought a white shirt of size 38, the next time you're there, there are a whole list of size 38 shirts waiting for you. How is it doing that? It's studying your buying pattern. From those studies, it is drawing lessons. It's probably not very effective right now. It's a bit crude. In fact, it's a bit annoying. If I've just bought a large size suitcase on Amazon two weeks ago, I don't want to buy another large size suitcase this, this week. What am I going to do with it? I want one suitcase maybe in a year or two years. So Amazon is a bit foolish in asking me to buy another suitcase. But it is learning. And next year when I go there, Amazon will not make this mistake. So you are going to have this in services industry going forward as well. Now for our services, services were 54% of Indian gross value added last year. So that is the major area. So perhaps going forward, our merchandise trade 
which is already under threat, this might just be superseded by a trade in services. And remember, as I said, services are getting more tradable by the day. Indian doctors sitting in India are diagnosing patients in Africa under the Pan-African Health Initiative. Telemedicine. Oh yes, that's just the first step. They're not doing the actual surgery. Are we sure that 15 years from now, they may not be doing the surgery? You already have robots doing surgery. But the robot is guided by a doctor standing right next to the operating table in case that robot makes a mistake. 15 years from now, maybe the probability of that robot making a mistake has dropped so low that the doctor could be based here in India, geographically remote. Remember that famous line? History is geography, which one of the uh, cell phone companies used to use. History really is geography. Uh, I'm sorry, the other way about Geography really is history. It doesn't matter where you are. What matters is where your business is happening. And this is where services are going to make a huge difference. For India particularly, we are growing at 3.6% services exports. Much of the rest of the world has negative rates of growth on services trade. So that gives you an indication of how important services are for us and how much we need to push on this particular area. So where does our advantage lie other than services? In labor. If you look at the change in the Chinese economy, China is now facing a labor constraint. Classic economic theory tells that you build up the, uh, economic progress and industrial progress by shifting labor from the agricultural sector to the industrial sector and allowing the industrial sector to grow on the back of the cheap labor supply. That's exactly what happened in China. From the more remote, from the more poor areas of China, labor flowed into the same zones of Guangdong, Shenzhen, Shanghai, the Pearl Delta, and they contributed to the growth in Chinese industrialization. Now, China is a huge country with a huge population, but it's not inexhaustible. Today, that labor supply is drying up. If you talk to your competitors in China, they will tell you that it's hard to get labor. They're having to pay greater prices for labor, they're having to engage in training of labor, and they're finding a situation where labor is not available. So China, with its huge population, is going for more automation. Imagine the paradox. So that is India's opportunity. Today, labor rates in China are perhaps four and a half to five times the equivalent labor rates in India. It's not a straight equation because productivity in China is also higher. But if you see the way the trend is growing, that offers an opportunity to us in India. If we can build up productivity, if we can eliminate some of these barriers to growing business, we have a huge opportunity. And the best example I can give you is shipbuilding. If you take shipbuilding as a measure of economic progress, Immediately after the Second World War, it was Japan which led the way in shipbuilding. Why? It's metal bashing. Plain and simple metal bashing, you need specialized steel, you can import the engine, you need welding, you need blocks, you need to put it together, you need a large shipyard. So Japan got into shipbuilding and the Japanese companies made a huge name for themselves in shipbuilding. This was after the Second World War. What happened in the 60s, the 70s, the 80s? Japan became increasingly rich. Its labor costs became increasingly more, it started moving up the value chain. Instead of making bulk carriers, and a bulk carrier is probably the lowest level of technology you can get in shipbuilding, they started moving into container vessels, they started moving into cryogenic tankers, they started moving into uh, liquefied LNG tankers. When they did that, the margins on these ships are so much better, they abandoned the bulk carrier business because it wasn't any more profitable for them. Who stepped in? South Korea stepped in. So Japan moved up the value chain, Korea came. And the story repeated itself. Korea moved up the value chain, China moved in. Now China is moving up the value chain. Who is going to move in? India. We have our coastline, we have a maritime tradition, we have shipbuilding ability. Vietnam is already into shipbuilding. If Vietnam can do it, why can't we do it? And I'm not even talking textiles. Let's not even go there because that's an even more embarrassing story for us in India, where Bangladesh has beaten us hands down in textiles without having much of a domestic cotton industry. That is something that perhaps we have learned over here. Now, as automation goes forward, India therefore can have the potential to be a hub for this kind of low-cost manufacturing, and we should now be ready to seize this. Using technology, using the benefit of this, we are already seeing from Taiwan and from China investment coming into India. These, remember, were the powerhouses of manufacturing. From China, for example, the consumer appliances giant Huawei 
In September 2016, they said they would manufacture 3 million smartphones every year in India. They are not doing it out of the goodness of their heart. They are doing it because of the size of the Indian market and the ability to manufacture cheaply in India. Foxconn, the famous Taiwan-based uh, unit, they are going to do a $5 billion mobile manufacturing hub in India. Why? Because we have 1.2 billion consumers. And even if you assume that just one quarter of them are going to buy a phone, that's a gigantic number for any manufacturer to look at. But we need to look at scale. In India, historically, unfortunately, we have not understood scale. In our small and medium scale industries, even today, we keep our small industries small forever. Just do a thought experiment. Oh, what's, what's my time? Uh, am I on there? Okay, sure. If I over like all Indians, I can talk forever, so you need to tell me when to shut up. Just take a look at the small industrial sector. The limit is 10 crore, plant and machinery for medium, right? Apply an asset turnover ratio. Apply an asset turnover ratio of 5. Apply 10 if you want, so that's pretty unlikely. How much can you produce with a fixed asset base of 10 crore? You can produce 100 crore. 100 crore is what? 8 crore a month. 8 crore a month is 2 crore a week. That's something like 40 lakhs a day. What industry is going to be competitive at these levels? How are you going to sell to a Walmart who wants to demand 1 million shirts when you are going to produce this much in a day? You are condemning the small industry to stay small and infant forever and never allowing them to grow in scale. China never made that mistake. China went for scale. We have scale. We have the Reliance Refinery. Credit to Dhirubhai Ambani. Whatever else are the accusations against him, he was the one industrialist who understood scale. He understood that if you are setting up a plant today, it's not today's demand which matters, it's your projected demand 10 years from now which matters. And he set up plants with scale. In telecom, we have that scale. In other areas of manufacturing, sadly, we do not have that scale. And we need to develop that fast. If you take a look at what Professor Klaus Schwab of the World Economic Forum said, he had a very interesting set of core prescriptions. He called this the fourth industrialization. And he said that, you know, you're having a fundamental revolution in the way you live, work, and most importantly, relate to each other. In my generation's days, relating or interaction, as we call it today, or interfacing, was you were talking across the fence, or you were talking over a game of cricket. Today, you have the WhatsApp, you have the Facebook, you have a whole different set of interactions. And that data from that interaction is being captured. Nobody in the manufacturing sector knew when my friend and I were chatting over a game of cricket. But if you are chatting with your friend in Facebook, I can assure you, the next time you apply for a loan, the bank you apply for that loan is going to ask you for your Facebook account. And they will know that you specialize in eating at Flurries or at Navoms, you like this particular kind of food, you buy shirts from Zodiac, you buy your shoes from Hush Poppies or wherever else are the brands that you favor, they know everything about you. This data is out there in the public domain. So it doesn't mean that it is, it's not related to a specific person. It's big data. It's big aggregates of data. But we are parting with all this data to the corporate sector. So your first two industrial revolutions there were what? water, steam, electricity, the standard manufacturing. The third was IT. Now you have digitalization. And this digitalization is changing. You are having billions of people connected using data devices. This little smartphone which all of us have and we are so proud of it, using for WhatsApp and emails and so on. That smartphone is telling somebody exactly where I am standing right now. It's probably telling me where I am. For all I know, this they could. I'm sure there isn't. But they could, theoretically, be somewhere on that smartphone recording every word that I'm saying. Suddenly, the entire world is a giant goldfish hole, which even George Orwell never really forecast when he wrote 1984. We are also seeing smart factories. You're seeing a greater, greater degree of interface coming in on intelligence, in power, in systems, in processes going forward. So to cut a long story short, under your fourth industrial revolution, what's going to happen? Your customer expectations are very different. Your product enhancement is a whole new ball game altogether. Collaborative innovation suddenly becomes much more important than an individual working in the laboratory. And organization forms change. It's not just a question of working from home. Today, with my cell phone and my laptop or my iPad, my office is wherever I am. 
It doesn't matter what is happening in my head office in Bombay. Standing right here, I'm in control of what is happening. I can never be away from my office. Now, interestingly, and this is a story which I'd like to share with you, because it's, it's a true story from my own experience. As a management trainee, and as you can see from my lack of hair that was a long time ago, there were frequent times when my boss was traveling overseas. After when the fact, half our people are traveling around at some time or the other. So suddenly I was faced with a decision. This was a credit decision, this was an investment decision, this was a pricing decision, it was some decision. What did I do? My boss isn't there. I can't keep going to my boss's boss's boss because at, as I go higher up the hierarchy, they are not going to be looking at operational decisions. So what do I do? I cross my fingers, I study the problem, cross my fingers, hope for the best, make the decision and then tell my boss when he came back, by the way, this is what I did and I hope I made the right decision and I hope that he's a good boss, even if I've made the wrong decision, he'll say, okay, next time don't do it, but fine, I understand that I was not around, you have to make a decision, you make a decision. Today what happens? The decision comes to me because I'm accessible. So the people down the line are not making that decision because the boss is accessible. Now this is a very dangerous trend because how else are they going to learn to make the decision? So sometimes in the senior management, you need to just throw the decision back and say, I'm not going to make the decision. Make the decision. I stand by you whatever you're doing. But you make the decision. Or else, come to me and tell me that I can't make this decision, but these are my alternatives. This is what I would do if I had the problem. And then I'll back you up on that. Now for that you need to have a lot of faith in your boss. It doesn't always happen. But it's a lesson that you need to learn. And this is where digitalization is coming into the picture over here. Now I don't want to talk too much on this going forward. Because uh, one of the reasons I was told, I'm happy to leave this in case you want to circulate it. But I believe that you have a system of interaction and question and answer. I enjoy working and dealing with students. And I would much prefer to have a question and answer session. So let me just sum it up what I would like to say in this way. You are facing as students a completely different paradigm. Please do by all means pay attention to what you are studying in the classes. Learn from your case studies. But learn at the same time that once you get into the real world, you are facing something very different. By its very nature, curriculums anywhere, not just in IIT but perhaps in the Harvard Business School also, will necessarily lag the real world. It's impossible for them to be ahead of the real world or on par with the real world for obvious reasons. Which means you are already, and I'm sorry to say, I don't mean this negatively, I don't mean this as a criticism. I'm simply stating a fact. You are already learning something which is slightly outdated because by the time you get into the real world, the real world is gone ahead. So please definitely learn what the institute has to offer you, but study outside that also. You must be aware of what is happening in the world around you. Old-fashioned people like me, Read the newspapers, read the journals, because that is our habit. Whether you do your reading on a tablet or on a laptop or on your cell phone, that is up to you. But please don't ever stop learning. You must always be open to new things, because that is what will help you keep ahead. Remember the point I made right from the beginning. Why are we all students? Because the day you stop learning is the day that for all practical purposes, you are dead. And you are far too young to reach that stage. So let me not scare you any further on this. I hope I have not depressed you too much with what I have said. But I wanted to leave you alert to the fact that the world is changing much, much faster than we used to know earlier and that we are likely to know in the future. With that, let me stop. The text is ready for anybody who wants to read. I am more than happy to circulate it. But right now, I would, if the professors will permit, I would love to engage in a Q&A session with the students. You are welcome to ask me any question. It could be trade, it could be banking, it could be anything. If I can answer, I'll be more than happy to. If not, I will happily pass the buck to my colleague Subhashish and ask him since he's based right here in Kolkata, I'll ask him to get back to you with the answer a little later. Thank you very much for your attention. Questions of international business in such an easy and understandable manner for most of us here. Uh, yes, uh, as sir has said, uh, sir is open to questions. Any of you? Good morning, sir. Uh, my name is Saurabh Kalkuria and I am from 2017-19 batch. Uh, my question to you, sir, that as you mentioned, the world economy is uh, growing at a very slow pace, like 3.2%. And most of the developed economies have a uh, bit of protectionism wall uh, surrounding them. So how do you think uh, India's great deficit will get narrowed? Uh, and does GST help to mitigate this problem? Will GST help to mitigate this problem? Yeah, 
thanks for the question. You 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 have two points. One is uh, the global growth slow. How can India's trade deficit be rectified? And secondly, on the impact of GST. Let me take the uh, in the same sequence that you asked. Him. See, firstly, when overall trade is growing, what does it mean? It means to overall pie is shrinking, right? So if you want to grow your exports, which is the meaning of reducing the trade deficit effectively, you have to take a greater share of the pie from somebody else. That's the only other way. So what it means is you have to be more competitive. Now look at our top five sectors. Refined petroleum, chemicals, light engineering products, textiles, gems and jewelry. The sad part is that all five are commodities. All five. So as a result, your pricing power is limited. The only way you can take market share is either offering larger scale, which is why I stress on scale, or lower prices. Now lower prices is a bulk scale. It becomes a race to the bottom because let's say if you're talking textiles. If you reduce the price of this jacket, Bangladesh will follow suit with a reduction. And remember the Bangladesh taka has depreciated much more against the dollar, whereas the Indian rupee has appreciated. So price is a bulk scale. The answer is scale. You build your scale of production to a point where your unit cost is sufficiently low that nobody can compete with. What gave the edge to the Reliance Refinery in Jamnagar? When it was conceived, it was meant to cater to sour crudes. Everybody in the world loves to refine sweet crudes. Sweet crudes are the easiest. Sour crudes are the most difficult. But they are also the cheapest. So your refining margins are the largest over there. Now, you can only do that with scale. You can't set up a sour crude refinery of a few million barrels. It has to be multi million. The same thing applies in textile. That's why I spoke about our SMEs. You can't export if you are an SME. Let me be very blunt. You can only be an ancillary supplier or a vendor to a large exporter. This is not the politically correct answer, but it's the honest answer. So this is where you need to build your exports. Your second question on GSP. I don't see GST having either a positive or a negative impact on exports. But GST will have a positive effect on the economy. You're having a huge benefit in efficiency because instead of a multiple cascading layer of taxes, you're now just going to have a value added tax, which is what GST really is at various levels, and a single tax all over India. Importantly, it cannot be evaded, right? Because there's a very simple economic incentive or disincentive, how we call it. If I'm a large manufacturer and you are my supplier, if you are not GST registered, I will give you two months, three months, six months, and if you're not GST registered, I'm doing business with somebody else because I will not get the input tax credit for my purchases from you if you're not registered. So there is a built-in incentive to all players to register. What does that mean? Economic activity is being captured, it is being taxed, the government revenues are going to go up, there's going to be greater transparency and greater compliance. But it won't directly impact exports. Did I answer? Thank you, thank you. Next question. Uh, employment. Uh, I look at it from a different, different perspective. Uh, as soon as the economy is growing, uh, we, we can have automation. Or the, as soon as the economy is growing, uh, so how do you look at this sector? Okay, I, I'm happy. I mean, I'm always happy to have a contrary, and will happen more irrespective of whether the economy grows or not. Let me give you an example. If you take additive manufacturing, the 3D printing, what you also call, what happens normally? Let's say the turbines for a power plant or the turbines for a jet engine. It has to be sculpted, and I'm using the word advisedly, sculpted not just made, because the shape of that turbine has to maximize the steam or the airflow that it catches so that it spins at the optimum rate with a minimum amount of input power, right? So the shape is intricate. What are the ways to make that shape? Today, how is it made? You pound out an approximate shape, you refine it on a lathe, you use a CNC machine in order to refine it, you trim away the excess, right? It takes multiple processes, multiple machines, multiple people, right? What happens with additive manufacturing? You are essentially printing in layers and layers and layers of complex shape. Till today, you are having jet engine components printed using additive manufacturing. Now, what 
as frivolous because no versus the growth there hasn't been growth but it's happening so essentially technology has now reached the point where its ability is so superior that irrespective whether you're growing or not it's just going to happen so you can't fight it you have to go along with it you're not convinced fair enough uh, as well as so what we use this so should be a uh, shift to service sector oh what on that part no 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 i'm not suggesting that we shift see you can't eliminate manufacturing right and given the cost of additive right now today you can't let's can you make a shirt out of additive manufacturing you can't a shirt still requires a cutting machine now you can probably get some get a machine to cut it in those specific patterns for the stitching till now nobody has invented a machine which will do the fine stitching it will do the stitching for a towel for a bed sheet for a large white with fabric but for a shirt for a item of clothing no machine exists yet you need an actual dexterous human hand which will feed it in. so it doesn't mean that it's going to happen overnight we shut down manufacturing and move to services what i was trying to say is our strength is more in services comparative advantage means you focus on your strengths you don't focus on your weaknesses a weakness doesn't mean you stop manufacturing but it means for the export market try to leverage your services that's what i'm trying to say as you pointed out the free trade is always the best for global competitiveness and efficiency when it comes to business practices but at the same time we find that uh, Developed economies have an advantage in terms of better infrastructure and all other uh, tools of uh, development, which you each and every industry. So, uh, developing countries need to subsidize or protect their uh, industries at least for an initial period of five to ten years. So, for a developing economy, what is the balancing act between protecting its industries for at least a few initial few years and at the same time keeping it open? To be lucrative to the world of global economy. Absolutely, excellent question. Thank you, in fact, for asking that. If you look at the history of the East Asian economies, the so-called Asian tigers, and for that matter, Korea, Japan, and for that matter, China, how did they grow? They protected their industry for a long period of time. They bought in technology. They insisted that if a foreign manufacturer wanted to shut set up shop in their country, he had to indigenize. He had to transfer technology right now that's something if you remember india very did very successfully with maruti we insisted but we didn't insist after that but that was our mistake i fully agree with you you cannot compete on a level playing field with the industrialized countries unless you help your industry there is definitely a case for i would i wouldn't say subsidy so that but definitely government help government help need not be only by way of a subsidy it can be by way of a policy direction as well so let's argue on that definitely the government should help definitely that has to happen the issue is how long does it continue right because if you continue forever then that child never grows up he remains a child forever so the trick is to allow foreign companies in and insist that they manufacture in india now how do you insist you can't legally insist you use tariffs you use the exchange rate right in order to incentivize them to manufacture locally and disincentivize them from importing You use tricks like this in order for that reason to happen, but you build up competition. After all, you don't want one or two in monopolies locally to build it up. So what do you do? If you are talking of cars, for example, you don't stop at one or two. Yes, probably for your market, one or two is enough. But you allow ten companies to come in the certain knowledge that four of them are going to go bankrupt. The thing is, you don't know which four are going to go bankrupt, but you allow all of them to come in. You let them compete. You let them fight it out so that the consumer gets a good deal, and let the market decide which of the four fails. The four who fail, their plants will be bought out by the successful people, right? So as a result, you use policy in order to give your home base a benefit, but at the same time, you ensure that the consumer doesn't pay the price for all this. So competition, therefore, is the answer. Due to the paucity of time, I'm afraid. I'm Abhinash from the batch of 2019. So as we know that India 
India exports a lot of generic drugs to the US and the other developing uh, developed countries. We are very uh, we are major in exporting generic drugs, but not the patented drugs. And as WTO is focusing on making their patents exclusively periods to 30 years, so how do you think that will affect India? Okay, I wouldn't worry too much about that because I agree the WTO is trying that, but it has to be a uniform agreement before the exclusivity period can be extended to that extent. The bigger worry to my mind is not the generics or the period of exclusivity. <coughs> it's again a paradigm shift in the pharmaceutical industry. We still have our strengths in chemistry and biochemistry, which enabled us to replicate drugs prior to going on to the world intellectual property standards. But today what is happening in the pharma industry is very different. You are now talking of biologically engineered drugs, genetically engineered drugs, for which there is no chemical equivalent. There is a biological semi-equivalent, what you call biosimilars. Because after all, if you have a drug which employs, for example, a fermentation process, you can replicate a fermentation process. But if you are using designer bacteria to produce that drug, Nobody else can have exactly that same bacteria. It can only be an approximation. That's why it's called a biosimilar. The biosimilars is a much different ballgame, which is why you're seeing the pharma industry in India suddenly on the back foot. Because as of what they're suddenly finding is those chemistry skills are no longer enough. The world has gone ahead. And unless Indian pharma in, in invests in R&D, in this highly challenging area, they're going to be left behind. Then we'll only be selling to the developing markets, which are demanding chemical equivalents, but we will lose the remunerative markets of the West. That is the bigger worry for us. Most of the major economics, be it US, Russia, Singapore, and uh, European economics, they have uh, kicked back their uh, growth. And, but if you see the international commentary from the economists, they say that the world out, the output is zoomed. So is it that uh, we are more focusing on the negative points or uh, we need to uh, change uh, from GDP being the parameter for uh, knowing the existence of uh, economy? Let me put it this GDP is not a very satisfactory measure. The problem is we don't have any better measure. It's like somebody once said about democracy. It's the worst of all forms of government, except for the others, which are even worse. So what do we have as an alternative to GDP? But to answer your first question, essentially what you're having is a business cycle issue. What followed Lehman Brothers, which is, go back to that time. If you take India as an example, it's not perhaps a perfect example, but let's take it as an example. From about 1998 till about 2007, India was growing at almost 10% per annum. Investment in India was growing at 36% of GDP. It was a phenomenal rate of growth. The banking sector was booming. The NPAs that you're seeing now were in the low single digits in those days, right? The world was booming. Then you had a plunge in layman. Suddenly you had a compression on incomes. When you have a compression on incomes, you have a demand for pressure. So what you ended up with is a much lower demand for an already high level of supply, which was still growing for a while. Today, that supply overhang is what is keeping growth down. Steel is the perfect example. There is so much of steel capacity. Somebody has to shut down a steel plant. Otherwise, you are never going to come back. Because you can't build up demand overnight. Demand is a slow process as it comes increase. So first, supply has to go out of the market. Now the big question is, who is going to close down the steel plant? China says, look, I have got a developing population. I can't afford to do that. India says, I have more poor people than anywhere else in the world. I am not closing down my plant. President Trump says, I don't care how many poor people you are, I'm not closing down any plant. So nobody wants to close down. The, uh, the sad answer to your question is, until supply and demand come into equilibrium, either demand rising, which is difficult, or supply, supply coming down, because people are going bankrupt and out of business, that is when you will see a growth in investment. And only when investment grows, will you see growth forward. Thank you, sir. Thank you.